So some of the college debaters at the time started writing some literature and started proposing these ground rules, and then, of course, the counter plan started. At the beginning, one of the principles of the counter plan that was carried over from the old days was that the counter plan could not be an example of the resolution. And it's my understanding that many of you still think that to be the case. This is one of the most important things I'm going to tell you today. Flush that thought. Because over the course of the last 10 years, the practice and debate has been that the affirmative plan as presented in essence becomes the resolution and everything else that's not the affirmative plan whether it's topical or not becomes negative counter plan ground is there anyone that did not understand what i just said yes as long as your counterplan doesn't like evolve with your counterplan, so that's right. Even though it goes under topics. Even if your counterplan is an example of the resolution, if it is not the affirmative plan, it's acceptable. That's another way of saying what I just said. Yes. But it would be a bad counterplan. No. No, it would not be a bad counterplan. You know, whatever your previously held thought on what makes a good or a bad counterplan under this concept of topicality, just kind of put it aside. And if you will, buy into what I'm telling you right now and go forward strictly with this idea. Can you say this again? Yes, I will say it again. I might say it two or three times. Because, no, this is very, very, very important. Okay, I want everyone here to leave for lunch. When we break for lunch today, I want everyone here to have a very clear understanding about the red and the green on this board. Okay? So, what becomes the resolution in a debate is the affirmative plan and only the affirmative plan. Can I clarify just a minute? Because that's not how I taught them, and that's not how they understand it, so I need to make some clarifications. Remember what I said about debate is it's sort of like a trend. It's very trendy, and, and, and they change. there's no really absolute rules in debate. Things change over the period of time. So the concept of counterplan has changed over the period of time. So what I've taught my students, and I'm not done. What I've taught my students was that if it, the counter plan should be non-topical, uh, okay, non-topical to the resolution. But now, nowadays, counter plan, the concept of counter plan has changed so that as long as it's non-topical to the affirmative plan, now they consider that as a legitimate counter plan. So there, there's just one example of how things change in the debate world. So I think after they get that off the, off the chest and they'll be able to more, you know, yes. yeah. Yeah, Brendan. So I can use China counter plan, right? Yes. Yes, so what I'm saying is, so, so if you're doing asteroid as an affirmative case, you can have an SBSB as a counter plan. Whoa. Wow. Well, right? I mean, yes, not, yes, you might be able to. But it might not be but, strategic. But let's not go there just yet. Because so. we're going to want to get into a concept called competition, which incorporates solvency. And yeah. so we're going to, you know. They, they understand the competition part, yeah. solvency part. It's just, OK. Well, yes. You don't know the So how do you Well, we'll give you various examples of counter plans. You do know some aspects of the affirmative plan. What is the agent in our resolution? United States federal government. So you know that, the, see, even though under this new rule, this new system, even though the negative can still, can now be topical, according to the resolution, the affirmative always has to be topical. So the affirmative can't, under this new game plan, if you will, 
under the way things are done, can't automatically just throw out the United States federal government and say we're going to have China do our plan. That would be a topicality argument that on the negative you would want to lodge. Interpretation, resolution says United States federal government. Violation, the affirmative plan uses China, not the United States federal government. It's a voting issue because, fairness, certainly. We came here prepared to debate resolution that said the United States federal government. We're prepared to tell you that the United States federal government's bad. As a matter of fact, we're here to say that China should do it. That's our counter plan. You've just taken our ground. The affirmative's just taken our ground. So see, you have a topicality argument. So you do know some of the rules going into the debate. You may not know whether the affirmative is going to run satellite X or aster asteroid mining. You know, all of those things you'll find out, and on the negative, you're going to prepare for all of those, aren't you? But you, whether they do ast asteroid mining, whether they do mission to Mars, whether they do satellites X, Y, or Z, okay, we know that the affirmative team has to be topical. They have to be resolutional, so they're going to use the United States federal government. So you have everyone else. Not only do you have any, ever, any other country or international organization, and we'll talk, we'll talk in depth about this today, you also have the United States federal government should consult with someone else before doing the plan. Okay? So there's all kinds of possibilities that you can prepare for that you know. Yes? So Bruno said that I'm working with someone else. Working with. Mm -hmm. Working? No. No. Because the resolution says that the agent is the United States federal government. And implicit in that is the word only. If the resolution wanted to give the affirmative the option to have the United States work with others, the resolution would have read the United States federal government and someone else of your choice should do the plan. Yes? But if, um, before uh, the federal government funds the program, if the program is already funded by a private sector, then the No, and the reason is, is the affirmative plan there would have to argue that the present system, for inherency purposes, right, the present system isn't working, so private sector isn't working. That would be, the, that would be your case structure for having the federal government and not the private sector do the plan. Okay, Let, and, and we'll go into a lot of these, I don't want to get bogged down, we're still at the very introduction here. So, but what I want you, and I'm going to repeat it, Ms. Chen said it once, I've said it twice, I want to say it please, one more time, okay? The plan as presented by the affirmative becomes the resolution. Anything other than the affirmative plan now becomes negative ground for a counter plan. Okay? And when Ms. Chen tells you the debate is constantly changing, the only thing that really is, is cast in stone as far as the rules are concerned is the speaking order and the length of the speeches. <laughs> Everything else can be debated. As a matter of fact, as we work through this counter plan this, this morning, we're going to talk to you how to make some of these rules. Some of these things that we're telling you are up available for debate. Now, your opportunity to win a debate on this part, you, you, you don't want to invest your time into debating whether the negative can argue a topical counter plan. That's, that's, that's kind of like paddling your boat upstream against a strong current. You're just never going to get in the dock. Okay? Now, the one thing that the negative team has to do is propose a counter plan that is competitive. When I say the word competitive, someone tell me what that means. You all should have your hands in the air right now. Because I know that Ms. Chen's covered it. Yes, dear. It's what? It can't be permuted, okay? No permutation. Permutation is a way to test competitiveness. Yes. 
What does permit? What what does it mean to be permuted? To do both, right? Or do part, uh, okay? Okay, but that's a test for competitiveness. But to be competitive, what's the goal? What has to be done by the counter plan? Not how do we check to see if it's being done, but what has to be done? Someone over here, I hear it louder. Mutually exclusive, that's another test. All right, let me give you two words, solvency. To be competitive, the, the, the negative counter plan always has to solve for the affirmative case, okay? That's why we can't have a counter plan on the space topic arguing we should go build more roads and bridges. Because building more roads, which is next year's topic, right? Because building more roads and bridges in the state of Illinois would accomplish nothing in solving the issues related to asteroid mining. So the negative counter plan always has to solve. To be competitive, though, one other thing has to happen. The negative counter plan has to solve either without producing a problem that the affirmative plan produces, or it has to solve and produce a benefit that the affirmative plan cannot produce. And what I just said here, the second half of solvency without a problem or with a benefit is called the net benefit aspect of competitiveness. So the counter plan has to solve with a net benefit in order to be competitive. Yes, ma'am. So I just want to clear, I just want to like ask you so I can clear this out. So negative has to solve what a problem solves. Yes. Well, let's talk about that for just a second. We'll go into more detail when we go into various forms of counter plan. And I think your, your, the clarity will become more when we talk about these various examples, okay? But let's just, let's just pick the, uh, an example here and, and answer the question. Let's say that the affirmative plan has the United States federal government do X, okay? And what the negative counter plan says is that the United States federal government in cooperation and in joint partnership with the Chinese government should do X. Okay? Now, theoretically, taking care of X is an easy thing to do. There's no reason why both parties working together couldn't do it. The reason you vote negative in this debate is not for solving the affirmative issue, because that's going to pretty much be agreed upon. However, by incorporating a joint partnership with the Chinese government, you would either avoid a problem or accrue or reap a benefit. And in that debate, what will happen is the arguments will be centered around the net benefit side of the counter plan as opposed to the solvency side. Now, having just said that, and again, we'll go into a lot more detail, it certainly is not beyond the question that the affirmative would argue that that counter plan is not competitive because the partnership with China would bring something in that would, that would be mutually exclusive. Perhaps the Chinese and the American governments would be in contradiction or in disagreement on how to do something to which we would have a stalemate and not accomplish solvency. Okay? Ms. Chen. Okay, I guess you were talking about China counter plan, but so counter plans cannot represent the status quo either. It can't be something that's happening already. The, yeah, there would be no purpose to propose. So, so that means when a negative proposes a counter plan, okay, they need to prove, I mean, 
they, they need to prove that it's not happening in the cells, so they, they must have inherency. Well, the affirmative would give you inherency, I believe. The affirmative case, yes, I mean, theoretically, when the negative presents a counter plan, mm -hmm. the negative agrees with the affirmative case structure, and part of that is inherency, okay? And so, uh, yes, the, 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 the negative would agree that there is a problem, it is a significant problem, and it is an inherent problem, which pretty much argues that the present policy can't solve it and doesn't solve it. So as soon as you um, present a counterplan, you're entirely abandoning the status quo? Yes. You no longer defend the status quo? Well, yeah, you could always kick the counterplan, couldn't you? If, it's, if the counterplan is run conditionally, yeah. then it's arguable yeah, that, that yeah. you can still go for the status quo. Yeah. I, I understand, but, but I'm talking about the generic in, counter plan? Yes. In, in general, at least the premise from the beginning of the debate is that you agree the status quo. Maybe you, you won't explicitly say, oh, we agree with the affirmative case, mm -hmm. and we agree the status quo can't solve it. You would never, there's no reason for you to commit yourself to that position. Mm -hmm. uh, although it is implicit in the beginning of your, but as we will talk a little later, uh, you can present a counter plan or multiple counter plans conditionally, in which case later in the debate as a negative, you could decide that you no longer are going to go for the counter plan, which leaves you as a default position of arguing that the problem is solved in the present system. Okay? Although most of the time, that doesn't become the focus of the debate. Most of the time, what becomes a focus there would be a theory argument, a topicality argument, or maybe some disadvantage that outweighs the affirmative case. Am I correct on that, Scott? Yeah. Scott's judged 150 rounds or 140 rounds of policy this year. I judged a lot of public forums, so when I ask about the top, this year's topic, there's my expert. <laughs> So I'll run some things by him just to make sure, okay? So competition is solvency without a problem or solvency with a benefit. That's the net benefit side, all right? So how do we test? And we've already talked about this. How do we test to see if there's competition? The permutation. Can we do both? If we can, the counter plan is not competitive. Because if we can do both, that means in doing both, we've avoided the benefit problem side. If we can do both, it means that we can acquire a benefit by doing both. Whereas the negative position is, is that only the counter plan can produce that benefit. If we can do both and avoid a problem, that means that the counter plan is not needed, that we can do the affirmative plan and not have this problem to deal with. So at the end of the day, when the negative presents a counter plan, the affirmative ends up with a position that not only gives it its plan, but the do both plans. Okay? That's the benefit that the affirmative gains back from the negative. The negative's benefit is they get all of the ground that's not the affirmative plan. But when the negative presents a counter plan, the affirmative now gains the ability to do both and win the debate. And the reason for that, 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 that just to, if you have the question, the reason for that is the concept of presumption, okay? The affirmative will overcome the presumption of the status quo by presenting its problem and requiring its solution. Scott? Is do both the only permutation problem? No. So then what, what I, I don't get it. I don't get it. What's, what's a permutation then? 
the permutation is doing though? Oh, is okay. Perhaps what we want then is we want to do part. So a permutation could be doing all of the affirmative plans and part or all of the counter plans? Sure, that's intrinsic, an intrinsic permutation. Part of the counter plan and all of the affirmative plan yes. would be an intrinsic perm, right? Okay. Help me, who's going to defend me here? What if, what if my permutation is just permutation to the counter plan? You know? I'm done with the app, I'm just doing the counter plan permutation the counter plan. Is that a permutation? No. Um, it's abandonment. What if my affirmative is asteroids, the counter plan is highways, and my permutation is to grow some vegetables? <laughs> Did I just like pick something randomly and add it on? Yeah. And what's that, Mr. Washer? Trash. What's that? Trash. Trash. Yes, that, that permutation is trash. That's a good word for it. The affirmative always has to stick to its plan. The permutation does not have to be all of the affirmative plan and all of the counter plan. It can be all or part of the counter plan. Yes. Yes. If you, if you permute the counter plan, does it mean that you're dropping the affirmative case? No, no. No, no, no. No, not at all. You never drop the affirmative case because that's your motivation, that's your reason for doing something, whatever it is. The affirmative case is your babies, and you don't drop babies. <laughs> you hold on to the baby tight because it's your affirmative. Don't drop it. What if you decide as the affirmative, or as the negative, that instead of doing all of the affirmative plan, you want to do part of the affirmative plan, and all are part of the counter plan. Scott, can we do something like that? Uh, you could. I would say that you cheated. If you do something like that, we wouldn't necessarily call you a cheater right away. I wouldn't. <laughs> what you're doing there is what's called a severance perm, or a severance permutation. So severance, S-E-V-E-R-E-N-C-E. -E -E. Separate. You separate. You severed. You so, severed part of the affirmative plan. Split it. Taken part of it and used it and taken the other part and Drop part of the baby. That would be Scott's position. Yeah. That you've just dropped part of the baby, and that's just as bad as dropping all of the babies. We don't drop babies. This is where we end up with theory debates. A link a <laughs> Okay? So there and, and, and there's robust arguments for and against severance permutations. and intrinsic perms. There's a whole body of, 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 of argument available. So now the focus of the debate becomes away from asteroid mining and more about what should each team be able to do. And this is how we start the road, going down the road to how debate can always change. Because remember, the only thing that's set in stone of the speeches and the length of the speeches. Okay?
The next concept that I will introduce as far as counterplans are concerned is how falls under the question, how committed will the negative team be to its counterplan? Okay? <coughs> against an unconditional counterplan. Okay? So that one's pretty straightforward. The opposite of unconditional is conditional. And it's kind of a... Mm, Nasty. I think this is a pretty good idea, but let's see if someone can talk me out of it. If my opponent is, is prepared, and good enough, I reserve the right at some point later in the debate, if I hear something, and I'm not going to tell you what that is right now, to kick the counter plan or no longer advocate it. Do you all understand when I say kick an argument? What that means is that you no longer are going to uphold that position. You're changing. You got a different idea. Your opponent said something. Now, does that seem right? Oh, yeah. If someone did that against you, if all of a sudden they ran a, con a counter plan, and they don't tell you what the status of it is, so here's rule number one. In, first, you're, you're, in your cross-examination, you always want to ask, what is the status of your counter plan? You Get them on record. Write that down. Yeah. Cross-ex of 1MC. First question, what is the status of the counterplan? In the 1NC. Okay. In the 1NC question of the affirmative, what is the, I mean, say in the 1AC's questioning of the 1NC. Yes. The affirmative would always ask the negative, what is the status of your counterplan? <laughs> you want to get them committed. And if they respond, something other than unconditional, your second question will always be, under what conditions would you kick your counterplan? What you're trying to do is you're trying to pin them to an advocacy before you stand up and waste the next, you know, four or five minutes of your 2AC arguing their counterplan, which they can just come back and say, ah, oh, we're not gonna run that anymore. We're not going to advocate that and waste your time. Yes. The second question is under what condition would you kick your counter plan? Would you no longer advocate it? When I say kick, that's a de debate term that basically means you no longer are going to advocate that argument. You're dropping that argument. Yes. Conditional? Conditional is where the negative, the, the question is, is what I repeat, what is a conditional counterplan? 
It is when the negative advocates a counter plan that at some point later in the debate, if something unstated happens, they can uh, they can no longer they can move away from advocating that position. In other words, they could drop their counter plan and advocate a different position, which usually is going to well, it's not usually. It, it can be various things that they go for. They could go strictly for topicality. They could go strictly for uh, for for some kind of a theory argument based on something the affirmative could do. Remember. At no time did the negative stand up and say the status quo is bad. So if they ultimately wanted to, they could argue solvency through the status quo. Less likely to happen, probably. Okay. But the point is, is that they're running the counter plan conditionally, and you on the affirmative want to know those conditions. Yes. So conditional is when, like. When they can drop their counterpoint, yes. and unconditional is when they stick to their plan. Yes. And what's this position? That's next. Okay. I, I will warn you that people will run multiple conditional counterplans. <laughs> sure. I've seen up to four red. And we'll talk a little bit about how to deal with that. I'll, I'll today. talk a lot about conditionality. Yeah. Even at the NJFL level? Uh, probably two is the most we'll see there. Okay. But the conditionality is probably my favorite argument in debate. So. Okay. Does everyone understand conditional and unconditional? You got your arms, you need it another time? Okay. I want you to understand this, so I'll give it to you another time. Because if you don't, I'll guarantee you there's others in this room that don't as well, okay? An unconditional counter plan is basically when the 2NR gives his or her speech, they're going to ask the judge to vote for them based on the counter plan and its ability to solve with a net benefit. It gets to the end of the debate. That's unconditional. A conditional counter plan is when the negative at any time in the debate for any unstated reason can decide to no longer advocate their counter plan, can drop it, or what we refer to as kicking it. Can I just sort of rephrase it? Okay, so conditional counter plan means you're married to that, okay? and. Um, I mean, no, I mean, unconditional means you're married to it, unconditionally, like your unconditional love from your parents. Okay, and conditional counterplan means you're going to divorce it. You don't like it anymore. Okay? Okay, so unconditional, like parents give children their unconditional love, it's going to be your plan unconditionally. You're going to love it no matter what. You're married to it. Uh, conditional counterplan means if you're not happy with certain conditions, Okay, you, you, you request certain conditions, and if you realize that you're not getting those conditions, then you're going to divorce it. You don't like it anymore. Does that help you understand? Yeah, <laughs> Okay. Now we're going to move on to the third option. And I can't wait for Ms. Chen's explanation of this one. All right? That's the dispositional counter plan. This really is not that hard to understand. This, it's not used that often. Okay. Uh, should I spend time just in case someone decides? Sure. Um, you should say what it is, but it's not. Okay. I, I've seen it two out of 140 rounds. Okay. So there, there is a very, 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 very slight chance that you will hear the negative advocate a dispositional counter plan. This is when the negative advocates a counter plan, but at the same time, they also tell you that they will advocate this counter plan through the entire debate, unconditionally, if you will, unless the, affir the negative, I'm sorry, the affirmative does something 
specific, and they'll identify what that something specific is. Okay? So they'll say, if the affirmative does X, we then will dispose of our counterclaim. And I see the wheels of divorce court turning already, yes. don't I? Does, does this dispositional counterclaim mean I've been married to you until you betray me, okay? Uh, Got it? <laughs> yes. Okay. I'm going to be married to you. I'm going to be married to this current plan until you affirmatively betray me of something, yes. something, something yes. that's unexpected. Okay. Yes. You are specific in the. You are specific as to if X happens. And you're going to name that condition. And you name say, that yeah. X. If you go out and have okay. a coffee with another man, that's going to be my condition of leaving yes. you or whatever. Okay. Go out and talk to other men. Uh, and, and we we don't want to get bogged down, as I said, on the on the dispositional counterplan uh, that much. Um, I can tell you the reason why it's not used that often. Uh, Twelve years or so ago, this was when Scott was probably your age. In the final round of the National Debate Tournament, which is the tournament for colleges, the University of Kentucky was asked in cross-examination, what is the status of your counterplan? Russ, Russ Hubbard uh, was the debater, and he answered dispositional. He really should have said conditional. Because once he said dispositional, then he had to be specific as to if the affirmative did something, what that something was, and that opened the door for the affirmative then to make a decision to do that or to not do that, and basically gather control of the debate. So it gave the power back into the affirmative's hands. Kentucky lost. And after that, everyone soon realized this dispositional counterplan is not necessarily a good idea. Okay? Because debate's all about keeping control. When you're on the affirmative, you always want to control where the debate's going. And if you're on the negative, you want to control. And the team that better controls where that debate's going is the team that's 99 out of 100 times going to win. And when you make a mistake, you in essence are giving that control up. So most of the time, debates aren't won, they're lost. A mistake is made that gives your opponent control of the debate, your opponent's sharp enough to take advantage of that and maximize it to go on to win, okay? So those are the, the three types of counterplans the status again if it's conditional or if it's dispositional if someone does run one you what are the two you all have those two questions written down yes can you give us an example like an illustration of a conditional counterplan Scott? Um, any counterplan can be conditional conditional just means that in the two and R that at any point in the debate, I can choose to extend an argument that the affirmative has made on the counterplan to not vote for the counterplan. So for instance, if the, affirm if the affirmative makes a permutation against the counterplan, I can, I can concede the permutation and say that means the counterplan isn't competitive anymore, so the counterplan goes away and forget about it. And just like, see ya. I mean, it's it's basically just like, you know, dribbling a soccer ball, and then you get halfway up the field, and then you punt it to the goalie. Right. But you just mentioned, if you say, uh, I concede these countries so we are no longer good, but what would be the result for the, for the, who will win? Probably will say it's abusive. 
Well, if if the affirmative makes that theory argument, they can still extend theory on the counter plan as a reason why you couldn't do that. But if there is no theory argument or the affirmative chooses not to go for a theory argument, then the counter plan just goes away. But the affirmative will always make an argument against um, conditional and counter plan. Uh, that's not true. Well, if you know about it, they will. Not necessarily. There are not teams. necessarily. The affirmative might want to try putting lockheads on that counter plan and winning that way. If it, yeah. you mean if it's not a, a necessary, if it, it if, if if the counter plan wasn't helping their strategy, then they might just decide not to argue. Against. Well, some some people like believe in conditionality and just don't. But as the chart, what's your 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 voting? If you vote it, under this candidate, how do you vote? It depends on the judge. So certain judges believe you can read as many counterclaims as you want. I believe you can read one conditional counterclaim. But that depends on the judge. But it also you also have to win the argument in the debate. So like I voted negative in debates that three counterclaims were right. Yes, sweetie. Yes. So that means that the negative goes back to the source, but does that mean that they have to answer the if, if the negative goes, if the negative returns to a defense of the status quo, then yes, they're going to have to deal with those case arguments. However, very seldom does the negative go back to the case. Am I correct, Scott? Most of the time, the negative is going to go for a topicality argument or something else. Topicality or a disadvantage. Or a disadvantage. disadvantage case. Yeah. Um, I would, like, I would caution you that in the debates that I have judged in the last six years. I have seen a team go for inherency twice. In most debates that the negative goes for inherency, the negative loses. Because it's probably not true. Like most people won't run an affirmative that's not inherent. I'll um, I'll share one quick story with you. The the last team that I uh, coached uh, in policy at um, at Celebration High School. And celebrations, the city in Florida that Disney created. Uh, we, uh, the team that I had was was not a highly skilled team, but they were the 32nd seed in the tournament, and so they were going up against the top seed in the uh, double octopano round uh, at um, uh, at the Catholic Nationals tournament. That that year, that number one seed was a very, very, very good team from Glenbrook uh, South. Uh, and um, so I, I knew that, that my two uh, students, young man and young woman, were not at the skill level that that other team was. And so what we ran was existential inherency. Uh, which was an argument that probably had not been dusted off for 25 years. Uh, and yes, we won that debate because the other team had no idea what existential inheritance was. Okay. And that, the, the debater from that team, Amira Lazarevic was her name, she was, she was a, uh, one of the fellows at the University of Kentucky summer camp that summer. And at registration when she got there, she kind of looked at me and I said, I'm so sorry. And she uh -huh. said, and, and, and Mira, you know, we had a wonder, you know, the debate community is small. You, yeah. you, you really, I mean, you really get to, to know the, the students from the other schools and, and build relationships and everything. And, and I just said to her, I said, I'm so sorry. And she said, you know, I had no idea what existential inheritance was. Her, um, yeah. her coach, Tara Tate, uh, was a very accomplished debater certainly knew what existential inherency was and so I said I said well how long did it take for Tara to explain that to you and she said oh we knew everything we needed to know about existential inherency before we even got to the airport to go home <laughs> so, so every once in a while was, was this Mima? Mima, Mira, Mima, yeah yeah and this is like like one of the top five players in the nation.
Yeah. Without a doubt. So uh, this this is a few years ago, uh, maybe what six six seven years ago possibly, five six years ago. I mean, my age time just just rambles on, right? Maybe like two or three years. I was born that because I've been away from celebration for five years, so I knew I was born that six. Oh, okay, okay. Anyway, so every once in a while. You know, uh, someone like me will come along and pull a little rabbit out of the hat that, that works. Um, you know, there's, there's an argument that shows up maybe once every five years that's called Spark. Does anyone in the room, other than Scott, know what Spark is? Okay. Spark, you know, most affirmative teams advocate some kind of an extinction generally through nuclear war, right? Well, SPARK is a negative counterplan position where you advocate starting that nuclear war. Because then you can control it. And the net benefit, of course, is that you don't send the whole world into extinction, just a small part of it. Like I said, about every five years, at, at, the, at, at what some consider the opportune time, that file's pulled out of a briefcase somewhere, the dust is blown off of it, and it's, it's run. So, you know, I call those things tricks. Yeah. What we're talking okay. about here, though, are not tricks. These are arguments that mm -hmm. you will hear, and we want to prepare you not only to argue the, the plans and the counter plans, but also the theory behind both affirmative and negative, Ms. Chen. Yes, because you said, according to, I mean, Scott and you guys, conditional counterclaims are run so often, right? Even at the end of, I think it's important for us to, I'm trying to go back to your statement about, um, it's not always necessarily argue back. When the negative consensus says that, okay, you permitted, so I'm going to drop my conditional counterclaim, okay? So one of the reasons for the affirmative to, to not, um, um, say anything about the counter plan is because they believe in that. Believe in the conditionality of the oh, counter plan, right? Yeah, after Mike's done, or Mr. Washington's done, I'm going to get into lots of discussions of conditionality. Okay, but why would that be strategic? To not read it? To not, yeah, to not say because that it's there. Because someone's in the back of the room that believes in conditionality, so your time is better well spent somewhere else. Okay, so then how often would the affirmative actually make a theory argument against um, conditional counterplans? It depends who the judge is. In, 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 front, of, in front of me, uh -huh. every debate. So, you, so if, they had a, if they had a decent judge like you, they would, they would, argue, they would well, make there, a theory there, argument. There are also very decent judges who believe in something that we'll talk about. Mm -hmm. that What's the ratio? Like half-half? Uh, more and more. I would say more people are just will judge the debate on what they think is one. I see. Just like I'm, I'm a truth seeker. I'm not. A, I'm not biased. So if we have judges like you, then the affirmative will make a theory argument against the. the Most people on NJFLs will probably believe that conditionality is the middle of the road, mm -hmm. but. A lot of teams will not adapt to people who don't like conditionality. Mm -hmm. Like, I'll have a hard time with that with my doing it to Baltimore. And they'll probably lose some weight. So we really need to get to, I mean, so it really depends on the judges. Yes. Everything in debate depends on the judge. And you know how we went through yesterday and saw the wiki page of all the teams? Mm -hmm. There's a wiki page of most judges but it's like thousands of judges. Okay. Will we know in advance who our judges are? Uh, you either will know who they are or at the big boy tournament, which is the NFL with the high schoolers, they actually, uh, they actually do a questionnaire, a 0 to 10 scale, asking various questions. Do they do that for the middle school as well, Scott? Do you know? I don't know. Okay, where you can look and see the judges in your room, you might get judge number 502, 
and you can turn to the page of Judge 502 and you can find out on a scale of 0 to 10, absolutely against, absolutely in favor of, what's your position on various questions. Mm -hmm. So you'll have some intelligence, yes. Okay. If you don't have that book, we'll know the names of some of the judges and uh, and be able to, to figure some things out from the resources that Scott was, was making reference if, to. If, if it's a nationally competitive judge, I won't even need to look at the page. They're pretty fair. And the kids. Well, I, I, I know them personally. Okay. You know, at the NFL tournament, we, there, are, there are competitors, as you already can figure out, not only from all of the states, but territories and, at least in middle school, some other countries. And so in, in just the 50 states of the United States, there's some diversity in what policy debate is. There are some states that just don't travel the national tournaments, but they go to the NFL national tournament. But at the tournaments they go to at home, there's a different maybe set of rules where counter plans still are looked at with a you know question in mind mm -hmm. as opposed to unconditionally accepted for debate. And so these are all things that, that will help you figure out as we get to the tournament and everything. Okay. Um, okay, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to really just start kind of a glossary for you. And these are terms that Scott and I are going to tag team uh, as, as we move through the day in the discussion of our counter plan. And I know Scott's got a couple that I didn't copy down on my list at breakfast that we can add to here. But let me give you a list uh, to begin with of different kinds of counter plans. And if you want to add something up there, I know you've got a couple that, that aren't on that list. Uh, the first is the term PIC, D-I-C, and it stands for Plan Inclusive Counter Plan. Plan inclusive counter plan. And what that means is that the negative counter plan is going to include some part of the affirmative plan. Now, I didn't say some small part or some large part. I just said some part. Okay? And again, we'll go into explaining these as we move through the day and talk in more detail. The second concept of a counter plan, a term that I want you to understand, is delay. We, we said this yesterday. Do the affirmative plan, but wait. Delay, its, delay it for six months or a year. And then the debate centers not on what the plan accomplishes, but on its timing. The worst counterplan for me. <laughs> well, maybe. Some, sometimes, it, actually, I, I disagree, Scott, because there's times, particularly as we move into the election season, where the politics disadvantage, well, yes. that a delay might actually be a, a good strategy. There, there are some that will be combinations of these, which. True. Are, True. We'll get into that as well. Okay, yes. Is it delay? 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 Is
would consult with some other party. It could be another country, it could be a group of countries, it could be an international organization. Uh, most people are going to say that the consultation should be genuine. What do I mean by this? Anybody? What's okay. the word genuine? I should go outside. Yes or no? Yes. Yeah. 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 All right, I'm going to go outside. Okay. All right, should I go outside? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes? Yeah. No, I'm not going outside. Why? Was that genuine? No. 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 So most people will argue that if, if you consult on the plan, that the organization or country that you consult, that you have to follow what they do. So there's a possibility that you could consult a country, they could say yes, and the whole affirmative could be done, but it's still competitive and still mutually exclusive because there's a possibility that that organization or country could say no. So this is where you get into like, you really do the affirmative, but you don't. I, I personally don't really like this kind of plan. No, consult. But it is used. Yes, there, it, it, it is used more often than it should be. Okay, the next example that I've listed is exclusionary. Is it, is it used anymore? Should we even put it down? The next example is agent. What do I mean by that? Everybody's hand should be in the air right now. What do I mean by agent? Someone, everybody's hand that doesn't know, I'm going to call. Back here, your hand's not in the air. What's the agent counter plan? Agent, yeah, what does an agent counter plan do? Someone helping. All right. Different, different, instead of the United States federal government, which is the agent of the resolution, it's some other country, some other group, someone other than the agent of the resolution. Who is doing the counter plan? It's kind of like this morning. One of the dads came and picked Scott and me up at the hotel. He was the agent of our transportation. If another dad would have come, if we would have said, no, we're not riding with you, you've got a safety record. We want a different agent. We want a different driver. Maybe we should have said that with our cab driver last night. <laughs> we could have walked. <laughs> we could have walked. We the exercise. Okay. So you change the agent. Um, the next one, uh, I, I have this feeling pecs probably aren't. No. Okay. Well, I got that one. A pack, a, a pack um, is the pre the reason I know it's not, it's the precursor to the critique. Uh, just because it was up there and everyone's going to go, what in the world was that anyway? A PEC would be where if the resolution calls for the United States federal government to do something, the counter plan would disband the United States federal government. Ban the plan. Plan exclusive counter plan is what PEC stands for. Now they're called critiques. You might see, some, you might see that in some textbooks. You certainly would see that in some of the articles that are surfacing out there on counterplan theory. Okay? You say counterplan you are a man? You are a Yeah, don't get bogged down by the concept of a PEC because we'll cover that under critiques. It, it, remember, remember at the very beginning, I said that many critiques are actually counterplans? The PEC is an example of a counter plan that is a critique or a critique that is a counter plan. Okay? Okay. Um, Scott.
Scott, you want to, you, you've added to the list, so sure. if you want to go there. I've got four other types of counter plans that can be run. The first is the conditions counter plan. This has gotten very popular in debate. I personally just like this kind of plan. So, counter plan, do the affirmative only if the affirmative runs on the budget. If it overruns the budget, don't do the affirmative. Only do, do the affirmative only if Obama eats chicken nuggets on Wednesdays. If he doesn't eat chicken nuggets on Wednesdays, don't do the affirmative. That, that, that was an example. Does, does everyone understand the difference between the conditions counter plan and running a counter plan conditionally? Yes, no. Con con conditionally is when you can decide to either go or not go for the counter plan. Con conditions is making the affirmative, for lack of a better word, condition on something else. The conditions, or a prerequisite to doing the affirmative. The conditions counter plan centers on the action of the affirmative plan. Running a counter plan conditionally has a substitute plan. I don't want you all to get confused by that. Like I just did, confused Yeah, I kind of confused myself there. All right. <laughs> all right. Oh, okay. The next one is called international fiat. Uh, what's fiat? Come on, everybody's hand should be in the air. The power that the affirmative is passed, right? That the United States federal government passes the affirmative. The negative should not get to stand up there and be like, you know, said, you know, Obama won't sign your affirmative. It's like, no, we shouldn't debate that. It's like, you know, we get the power that it's passed, you know. Senator Scott Brown is not going to hold up the whole proceeding. There is a Senator Close. Of what? Fiat, F-I-A-T. Yeah, power what? That we don't have to debate the imp that whether or not the affirmative can be passed in the government. We do not have to debate that the affirmative plan will be adopted by the U.S. federal government. We only advocate that it is a good idea and should be. Fiat centered around the word should. That way, as an affirmative team, you'd never have to stand up and prove that the House of Representatives and the Senate individually would muster up a majority to approve your plan and then send it on for the president to sign it and then have potentially the Supreme Court look at it to determine if it's constitutional or not. Okay? Because if you had to prove as the affirmative all of that, You'd never have enough time to argue whether your idea was a good idea or not. Your, high, your, your middle school students, you don't have the power to make a United States Senator, a United States Representative, the President of the United States, or a Supreme Court Justice. You don't have the power to have them do something. You only have the power to convince a judge that it would be a good idea if they did this. And international fiat? International fiat is when you fiat that another country does the affirmative. So the European Space Agency should do the affirmative. The Ukraine should do the affirmative. In, for the space topic, 
Do you think that you can have any country do the affirmative? Yeah. Why? How many countries have space programs? Okay, better question. How many countries have launched a human into space? One, two, three, 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 two, three, two. The United States, Russia, and China. China just did, I believe. Uh, Japan. Uh, there are 13, I think, other countries that have astronauts who have been to space, but they do. Their countries do not have the ability to go to space themselves. So, for instance, we've had Japanese astronauts. We have had, you know, Korean. We've had. But they, have, but they have ridden aboard either the United States or Russia's missiles and spaceships. Or now Russia. Really? The next one, and we'll cover this in conditionality, is just multiple counter plans. I don't really think I'm need to spend a lot of time here. So international PR means that we don't have to worry about uh, all the countries. It's, it's, support, it's yeah. just the United States should not do it and another country yeah. should do it. And we don't have to argue whether the other one will do it or not. Yes. Right. The word fiat means that you do not have to prove that the Congo will do it. That they should. Although you probably need a piece of solvency evidence that says they can. They can. Just like you and I saw the for the affirmative. The last one we're going to talk about, and this is probably a little crazy for you, is a word pick. What's a pick? Very good. Inclusive counterplay. So it does most of the affirmative, right? All right. What's your plan? How about for the discover affirmative? Your plan is the United States federal government should deploy the Deep Space Climate Observatory. A word pick would decide that one of those words is bad and replace it with another word or not replace it. So for instance, an example of this would be some people don't like the word the. So they would read in this instance a plan text that is not grammatical, grammatically correct. But it would be United States federal government should launch deep space climate observatory. Or what if what if space has bad meaning to it? What if exploration as used as a word has bad meaning to it? Because when we explore things, we, you know, the root of the word explore meant that we sort of push other groups of people to the fringe and sort of annihilated their populations like we did, like the, well, like the now United States did to the Native Americans. You just you decide that one word in the plan text is not good and get rid of it or replace it. It usually connotes or denotes some kind of a negative image, and you're arguing that that's just not the, the right kind of it. It's it's a critique. It's a word critique in essence. But we'll, we'll, we'll definitely get into that more when we talk about it. Alright? Yeah. So you just, you just want the appropriate book back, right? Not necessarily one word, not necessarily a book. You need the whole plan, right? Right. I thought you did. It's a rhetorical position more than a, a, a policy position. Okay, they want to know about multiple counter plans. Um, I think we're going to take a break for a second, yes. and then I'm going to talk about 
conditional counterclaims and that will assist us for